Namaste to all of you. A very warm welcome to this evening's program. We are honored to have His Excellency, the President of the Government of Tibet, um, speaking to us today. It's an honor to have him on our show. As you all know, that um, uh, Tibetan government uh, has been running in exile. Since 2011, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has given up his role as uh, the administrative head as well. And uh, Lopseng Ji was the first uh, elected prime minister after the, uh, after uh, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama Ji gave up uh, this particular role. And uh, now uh, Lopseng Ji is the current uh, president of the Tibetan uh, Central Administrative uh, uh, you know, uh, Government. And uh, friends, uh, we are very honored to have him today. Uh, just before we start the program, it is but uh, customary for me to introduce Pragya Bharati to those of you who are coming onto the call for the first time. Friends, Pragya Bharati uh, was founded about 28 years back by five uh, great stalwarts and intellectuals with a view to bringing Bharatiya perspective among intellectuals. Uh, our chairman, Dr. Hanuman Chaudhary, who is a Padma Shri awardee, uh, he was a former chairman of uh, VSNL. Uh, he is the founding chairman. And of course, Ram Madhav Ji was the brain behind uh, this entire movement. Uh, Ram Madhav Ji was the found, one of the uh, founding members of this organization. And today, he is the National General Secretary of Bharatiya Jinta Party. Then we have uh, Sri B.S. Sharma Ji, who, is, uh, who was a pharmaceutical professional and is a uh, social activist right now. We had two more gentlemen who are no more with us, Harisha Sharma Ji and Vakadi Pandaranga Ji. These five people had started it about 28 years back with a view to uh, bringing some kind of uh, uh, semblance in the whole intellectual debate, which was getting drifted away from uh, India focus to the lobbies that were pushing their agenda in India. Friends, uh, we have been uh, doing various seminars, conferences, workshops all through these years. And uh, we, we've been running a magazine by name, Bharti Prakya, for the past 20 and odd years. This is a monthly English magazine. Those of you who have not subscribed to it, kindly do subscribe. And also, please do share, like, and uh, retweet uh, our handles, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, you know, Telegram. All these with the name Pragya Bharati and uh, also our YouTube as well. And please do write in to us for any suggestions and any advices that you have or you want to be part of the story. Friends, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, Dr. Lopseng Ji uh, has been uh, one of the foremost pioneers in uh, you know, the democratic movement within the Tibetan community, both in India as well as abroad. Uh, he was born very close to Darjeeling, among the Tibetan refugees who lived there. Uh, his father was a uh, uh, you know, holy monk in one of the Tibetan uh, line. Then uh, uh, Lopseng Ji went on to do his law from Delhi. And thereon, he went on to uh, uh, continue his uh, work his studies in the USA, uh, whereon he completed his doctoral degree in law as well there. And uh, uh, while he was studying in the USA, he had organized a conference of uh, Tibetans uh, from mainland China as well as from India and the diaspora in the USA, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama was also present. Friends, uh, uh, as we all see that China is no friend of anybody, including India or Tibet. Since 1949, China has been an occupation of a lot of territories which never belong to China. They have this policy of five fingers and the central hand. So Tibet is one of their uh, important outreach. Tibet, Xinjiang, Manchuria, Mongolia, and of course, Yunnan. All these provinces are captured by China over the period of time. Uh, Tibet had a lovely kingdom for many centuries. And then the Qing dynasty, or Q-I-N-G, I don't know how do they pronounce it in China. And uh, about 250, 300 years back, they occupied Tibet. And since then, uh, at least temporarily, uh, Tibet was reporting into Beijing. But they had their own independence, their own religious independence, and their own cultural independence. However, after the Communist Party of China took over the mainland China, they brought in all uh, huge armaments and uh, you know, uh, army, and they completely eliminated that independence that Tibet had. Even till 1949-50, friends, India had uh, India was running its uh, post and telegraphs and telecommunications from Lhasa. 
that was the connection we had and uh, on the uh, en route from uh, dam chowk in ladakh to kailash manasarovar there was a village which was still paying taxes to the jammu kashmir administration that was the post where people used to take rest before they used to go on the kailash manasarovar pilgrimage we had very great relationships between tibet and bharat but unfortunately after the chinese takeover the borders became hard borders and people struggled his excellency the dalai lama tried to find peace with china but it never happened finally he had to take the hard decision of moving away from tibet his uh, holy potala palace and all the great uh, legacy that he had to leave behind and come into india um so friends we all are aware that these people have been living in uh, Delosi in uh, Himachal Pradesh in McLeod Ganj and other areas but they have been such a peaceful community that the while they have assimilated in this country including in south india central india they put up many monasteries they have been one of the most peaceful communities where we all love them we have been going to their monasteries we have been doing lot of uh, uh, you know interaction with them but it is time that china which has been so belligerent who is trying to provoke so much and create so much of problem along the india border india tibetan border india occupied tibetan border has to be shown its place and the people who can really stand up to china culturally and morally is tibetans so friends it's my great pleasure and honor to invite today dr lobseng sange ji who is the president of a duly democratically elected tibetan people lobseng ji please welcome to the show and it's an honor for all of us The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, sir, Chief, for your kind invitation. Glad to be invited to, uh, you know, thank. I'm glad to you know uh, founders was uh, my friend, you know, uh, Ramadev Ji. And uh, recently, he published a book of his holiness. Uh, his message, greetings, his holiness, was widely shared, much like. all over the world so good to say it uh, with your uh, uh, as the title says that uh, is to be safe from china to secure i think pretty given historically it was given an inch of land border in india and china for hundreds for thousands of years it was all in tibet and india so this is very important uh, given the recent you know uh, unfortunate uh, uh, tragedy uh, many people ask me this question that i should participate and i should give my perspective uh, then i said look uh, you know isolanis the lama and here in dharamsala we've been you know challenging the chinese hegemony and occupation of tibet for the last 60 years we've been vocal we've been traveling all over the world seeking justice for tibet and we always say tibet it was illegally occupied and remains under occupation and we still say border is between was and is and should be between bharat and tibet right but with uh, i hope through your institute to grow and once you say tibet is part of china you are validating and legitimizing chinese government presence in tibet and once you say is indo china border right then you essentially inviting chinese soldiers to the border of india now when indian soldiers and indian people complain why are they coming to the border why there is incursion into our territory chinese people will say you say tibet is part of china now you say this is china's border not tibet's border you essentially validated our presence at the border right so then at the moment the discourse has been the argument is always over or oh, one acre of land here one kilometer band the fourth finger to third finger the discussion and the debate the quarrel is about one or 10 20 acres of land when in fact by recognizing tibet as part of china which is the official stand of india you have essentially given 2.5 million square kilometers of land 25 lakhs of square kilometer of land and everything that tibet was and belonged to tibetans now essentially you accepted it belongs to china 
Now, when they come to the board, incursion happens and they say, oh, why is Parampa and Dalai Lama is not saying anything? Why is Tibetan people are not saying anything? You know, issue is raised. But in 1914, as you mentioned, a similar convention, the Tibetan Prime Minister Lunchin Chatra signed a treaty with British India and essentially drew the line or the border on the commercial side, and it's called Macmon. Right? So at that time, we did, you know, uh, demarcated it. Essentially, we ceded certain territory to India for India's security. Now, you know, if you look at the present India, Indian government or India follows a lot of laws and regulations since British Raj. 100 years old, 200 years old, you know, some archaic laws are even followed to the world. You know, so colonial system under British rule was not good. But one good thing the British Raj did was to demarcate the land or the border on the Arunachal side, and it's called Magma Line. Now, Indian government or Indian people, Indian news media, everybody says, yes, we prefer Magma Online as the border, but no one recognizes it, you see. So you follow every small loss that was left behind the British Raj, but why are you not recognizing the treaty sign which violated the border? Now, China disputes it, and India prefers Magma Online, but we, the Tibetans, signed it, right? So that's why the topic Tibet needs to be safe, mainly because to save Bharat, you have to secure Tibet, because Tibet was the zone of peace. It as the buffer zone between India and China. There was never Indo-China border. There was no Indian Chinese in the soldiers uh, facing eye to eye. It was always Tibet. So for hundreds and thousands of years, Tibet acted as the buffer zone and as, a, 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 acted as a zone of peace. And at uh, one time, the Tibetan official, when Chinese army was coming, invading Tibet, the Tibetan official wrote to the uh, Indian government saying, look, at the moment, we have only 75 to 100 soldiers guarding 3,500 kilometers of border between India and China. Only 7,500, okay? Meaning we trusted India, India trusted Tibet, and border was left open. Now, at that time, it was, it was said, if unless you come and support us, you might be in trouble. Uh, but then, you know, uh, Tibet was occupied, and then normalized relationship with China happened with, with India. Um, now, Indian people and India as a country is realizing the price India is paying for letting go Tibet, for accepting Tibet. Now, you mentioned, right, the Tibet was, is, is the palm that was Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader said, and afterwards we have to go after five fingers. So, Ladakh, Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, and Arunachal, the five fingers. So, Tibet was occupied. Now, they're coming after five fingers, they will continue to come. So, 2017, they went to Sikkim, you know, and bordering Sikkim and uh, Bhutan. Now, they came to Ladakh, and next it could be Arunachal, right? So, we know the interference in Nepal as well. So not just Mao Zedong said at that time, what palm and five fingers. The Indian counterpart was Din Dayal Upadhyayji. He said, if you let China occupy Tibet, their greed will extend to Bhutan, Nepal, and Sikkim. This is what Din Dayal Upadhyayji said at that time. But people thought that once we normalize relationship with China, we will give recognition of China in 1950. Barely any democratic country was recognizing China, except for the communist bloc. No democratic country was recognizing China. India was one of the first ones to say, we will recognize you, we will accept you as a member of the United Nations. And later, a seat of power to India was given to China as the member of Security Council. Now, 60 years later, India is trying to gain the Security Council. Who's blocking India? China. Right? So these are the price, heavy price, that India paid and continues to pay because in 1950s, when there was a great debate in the Indian parliament, the participants were Atal Babahir, Bajpayee Ji, Jai Pakash Nara, Ram Manohar uh, the uh, Ambedkar Ji and uh, Mukherjee, all of them took part and say, we have to support Tibet at this time. At least let's say Tibet is disputed. Had India taken a stand and said Tibet is disputed, if not occupied, 
they cannot enter Tibet, come all the way to the border of India because you know it's disputed, right? So this is a price. So hence, I can uh, say with absolute certainty, yes, yes. You no, know, Tibet needs to be safe for India's safety. Because Xi Jinping has said, for, to for the security and stability of China, it's very important to secure and stabilize Tibet. So China sees Tibet as so important for the stability and security of China, stability uh, and security of Tibet is very important. So based on which one road which connected China to Tibet, which promised us to bring prosperity and uh, you know uh, benefit Tibetan people, initially we believed it, but later we found out that they brought trucks, guns, tanks, and occupied our country. Now that one road has become 100 roads. All the roads are coming towards India. One airport, a bare airport in Lhasa at that time, now has 30 airports in Tibet, and six are military airfields. One railway line is becoming two or three railway line coming to Nepal and coming to border of India and it could come to Arunachal Pradesh as well, right? So what has all this railway line, airport, and roads are all dual use, meaning military grade. So has militarization of Tibet was made possible because India accepted Tibet as region of China. So hence we need to, to review this and say, what are the mistakes we have made? Otherwise, you know, there will be another land incursion, there will be another, you know, conflicts, and there will be certain people dying. And then essentially you will be arguing about, you know, uh, one kilometer here, 10 kilometer here, 20 kilometer here, where, where, whereby you overlook, you know, 25 lakhs of square kilometers of land. Now, let me come back to, you know, let, let me go back a little bit to history. Um, if you look at Chinese description of Tibet, it's barren land, it's a harsh land, barbarians live there. If you look at old texts of India, even Hindu scriptures, and Tibet is described as this Himalayas, the beautiful Himalayas where gods and goddesses live, and actually Lord Shiva, you know, Mount Kailash, Manzarova. So that's how even the literature in India, ancient literature, describes Tibet in a beautiful way, whereas the Chinese literally describe Tibet in a negative way. And it's a fact that you know, there are many great civilizations, and Tibet is one of the ancient civilization. And perhaps it's one of the rare civilizations where we heralded the scholars and translators as national heroes. National heroes are army generals or politicians or poet or things like that. But in Tibet, national heroes are translators. Why? To bring Buddhism from India, from Nalanda University to Tibet. Tibetan kings and the ministers and the rich business people competed and patronized scholars. They funded them. You say, you go to the holy land of India, learn Sanskrit, learn Buddhism, and bring it to Tibet. And they are called Losawas. They were the national heroes. National heroes were those people who came to India, learned Sanskrit, and brought it to me. Even this, you know, a um, uh, lot of talk is about, you know, we must make India great and we must be a great uh, in the world and we must export this, export that, and we must, uh, you know, uh, popularize the brand India. The single most popular widely accepted commodity or product or wisdom of India is Buddhism. It has led to 150 countries. In 50, 52 countries, large majority of the population follow Buddhism. 14 countries have majority Buddhist. And what did you know, India do? Nothing. They followed the came from this and they came, they went back and, you know, civilized the, these countries with Buddhism. So, for more, they didn't by spreading Buddhism to these countries. All these Buddhist countries, when they opened their Buddhist texts, 
Even in Tibetan language, we say Jagar Ketu, Om, Jagar Ketu. I mean, Om, in the language of you know, uh, India, in the language of Holy Land of Bhat, this is the text we were blessed with. So every Buddhist scripture, when we pray, we pray first with paying reverence, respect to India, the Holy Land of India. And all these Buddhist countries do. So they have a natural affinity India because Buddhism was the greatest, biggest export India has ever made. And dividend is still coming. And Indian government is applying GST in are getting 21% on tourism, right? Why? Because for minimal, you know, contribution or investment from India for more than 1,000 years, India is still giving dividend. It's Buddhism. Same thing with Tibet. Now, at the moment, Tibet happened to be, at least historically, the holiest, pure Buddhist country. And scriptures, our Tibetan scripture, you know, like in Hindi, you say kaka khanga anga tanya nya. You say kaka khanga chata tanya nya tata tana. It's from Gupt Moria period. If you look at the script, it's the go, uh, more, uh, Gupt, uh, Moria Gupt period script. You know, yeah. the language also, spirituality, civilization. And geographically, as I said, Tibet sits as the over India and South Asia in the roof of the world. It's beautiful to look at. So hence, we were very much connected and continues to be uh, connected that way. And uh, uh, at the moment, uh, when Tibet was occupied, first thing the Chinese army did was destroyed our Buddhist civilization. 98% of monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99% of monks and nuns were destroyed. Buddhism as we knew it was physically destroyed and physically disallowed. Even today, they are destroying mandiris after mandiris in Tibet. They are putting a lot of restrictions for one monk to go from one monastery to another monastery. But recently, in a few months, they imposed a restriction. They don't allow. Why? The Communist Party's goal is to destroy Buddhist civilization, thereby Buddhist culture and Tibetan identity. At the core of Tibetan identity, they know it's Buddhism. So at the invasion, during the invasion, the invasion, approximately a million Tibetans have died. So this is the price we paid. And even today, 154 Tibetans committed self humiliation They have burned themselves. Gordon um, House, which comes out with a report every year with Freedom Index, right? They list all the countries and major freedom. Syria continues to be listed as the least free country in the whole world. But do you know the number two? Number two is Tibet. For five years in a row, Tibet is listed as the least free region after Syria. Now everybody knows about Syria, but how many people know that Tibet is the least free region in the whole world? Now journalists based in Beijing says that for journalists to go to North Korea is easier than journalists to go to Tibet. So we know how restrictive North Korea is in you know, allowing journalists to visit. But Beijing-based journalists said for them it's more difficult to go to Tibet. Because of the restrictions, journalists cannot go, researchers cannot go, you know, scholars cannot go, even diplomats cannot go. Tibet, what's happening in Tibet is not known. So we ought to let people in the world know what is happening in Tibet. Because Unless you know what's happening in Tibet, you won't understand China, what China is capable of. So for the last 60 years, we've been saying, what happened to Tibet could happen to you, including India. And no one believed that. Prime ministers after prime ministers had this, you know, competition or cooperation options. So the Nehru to, you know, all the prime ministers, they chose cooperation, except for Lal Bahadur Shastri who wanted to compete, but unfortunately he died. Even he told Tibetan delegation that, you know, I would like to recognize the Tibetan government exile, but he, he did not live long. Otherwise, all the prime ministers so far chose cooperation, thinking that if you cooperate with China, if you overlook what happened in Tibet, perhaps I can have a good deal, I can have a good relationship, I can have a good personal relationship, and we can improve relationship and live harmony, you know, live in harmony. 
and that's why the uh, Panchit was also signed, thinking this five-piece uh, plan was the hope. But, you know, you must know the origin of Panchil. In 1914, when Simla Convention was signed, on the sideline, the Magmon line as the border demarcation was signed. And a trade agreement was also signed. So the trade agreement was supposed to be renewed every 10 years. So the trade agreement was the trade from Tibet to India. And in that agreement, pilgrimage to Mansarova and Mount Kailash was also allowed. That means pilgrimage from India to Tibet and Tibet to India was also allowed. So there was the trade agreement, which was to be renewed every 10 years. So 1944, 34, 44, it was renewed between British India and Delhi and Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet. After independence of India in 1954, at that time, Indian government thought we will renew not with Lhasa, Tibetans, but will, they will renew with Beijing and China. After several months of negotiation, they came back and called it Panchil. But if you look at Panchil, it has nothing to do with the body of the agreement. Panchil are put in the preamble of the trade agreement. These are the five points. If you look at the body, still it's about trade. Trade route and trade taxes and pilgrimage rights for Indians to go to Tibet and Tibetans to come to India. That's it. But when it was signed, now here, I will uh, end by saying how dubious and how you know, the Chinese uh, Communist Party is capable of betraying your trust. Now, seed of betrayal towards India was planted in Panchil with the peace agreement. Huh? So the Indian side came, they were very excited. They said Panchil Shabd is a Sanskrit word, it's an Indian word, it's our original. But I think China later signed another Panchil with Burma, you know. And they said, no, no, the Panchil term is ours. But that aside, India, Indian government was so pleased, they wanted it to Panchil to last for 25 years. But the Chinese said, no, no, only five years. Now, when you sign a treaty, how can you have it last only for five years? Then they negotiated a bit, and after some time, they said, okay, eight years. Now, normally, any kind of major agreement is signed. According to Indian version, Panchil is this big deal. But Chinese says, no, no, only eight years. Normally, this kind of treaties should last for 20 years, 100 years, 50 years, like that, right? But only eight years, which is a very odd year, okay? Now, after 1954, what happened after five years? 54 plus 5 is 59, Tibet was occupied. and death. We were promised prosperity, we were promised peace, and we were promised benefit, all kinds of things. Ultimately, we got betrayed. So if you want to understand Tibet, or if you want to understand what China is capable of, you must know what happened to Tibet and what's happening now in Tibet. If you don't know what's happening in Tibet, you will never understand what China is capable of. So, I mean, you know, your institute is good. You know, we would like to see Tibetans in various think tanks in India, Tibetan researchers, Tibetan scholars. There has to be a Tibetan studies program different universities of India. Because you have to educate the Indian youth about Tibet. Only Tibetans can do it. For example, in 2017, when Doklam incident happened, and I was watching you know, national television, and there were so many quote-unquote experts talking about it. But they didn't know the term Doklam. What is this Doklam? It's the name of a place. What is this? It's a Tibetan term. Doklam means difficult road. Doklam means nomadic road, right? Dolam means a road. Now, it's a nomadic road, it's a difficult road or a road, you see. Unless you know the Tibetan term Thoklam, Thok, you won't understand. Now, how can you say, you know, this land belongs where without understanding the term? So, everybody is talking about Thoklam, but no one understood the, the meaning of Thoklam, right? 
Now, similarly, at Galwan Valley, all these things are going on because the expertise in India is lagging because you don't have many Tibetan scholars and researchers in different think tanks and universities. If you go to America, as you mentioned, Giridharji, at Harvard, there's the Tibetan Studies Program. You go to Columbia University, there's the Tibetan Studies Program. There are Tibetan Buddhist professors. It is Nalanda tradition, it is Buddhism, different universities. How many universities in India has Buddhist program? Very few. Delhi University, few. Major universities in Germany, UK. So all this needs to be done. So that, you know, now today I'm talking about Tibet needs to be safe from China to secure Bharat. Yes, security of, as Xi Jinping said, security of China is dependent on Tibet. In fact, security of India is dependent on stability of Tibet. So this is very important. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of questions and I'm happy to uh, answer all the questions. But let me end by saying one thing. Recently, you know, the former Foreign Secretary Nirupama Raoji mentioned that the Bharat Ratna should be given to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And people in the Himalayan region, from Sikkim to Arunachal to Ladakh, and you know, all the major leaders and population, they wish, because they see His Holiness as their spiritual leader. They all wanted to see Bharat Ratna be given to His Holiness the Lama. And then Indians, our friends all over India have made this appeal as well. So what it appears is that even it's, you know, it's these people are doing it, okay, and we are very appreciative. What it appears is that the sentiments of the Indian people, feeling of the Indian people, respect towards His Holiness Dalai Lama and Vadar Ratna is already awarded now. And His Holiness Dalai Lama doesn't need one more award because he has been awarded all the major awards in the whole world from Templeton Prize to UN Environmental Prize to a Nobel Peace Prize. You just name any major awards in the world. His Holiness has 150 some awards already. Right? But only country that's lagging is India. And you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama calls himself a proud son of India. I think proud son of India who so far preserved in the calendar tradition, right? Who is the number one advocate of India around the world? His Holiness Dalai Lama. When His Holiness Dalai Lama met with uh, President uh, Obama, I think in 2014, in the 45, 50 minutes of the discussion, first 20 minutes he was talking about India, 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 India. You know, His Holiness Dalai Lama is our leader, Tibetan leader. We, you know, he should be first thing he should be talking about Tibet. The first 20 minutes was on India, India, India. So his love for India is known. And his appreciation and, you know, and a great knowledge on Nalanda tradition is well known. And he is the number one ambassador uh, of India and the world. And I hope, I'm glad to see the sentiments of Indian people to give his holiness Bharat Ratna or another award is given now. It's widely known. And uh, whether the leadership act uh, on this matter or not is for us to see. But one more, one more award to his holiness will either make him bigger or small. He is already a very big person, you know. He is one of the greatest person of 20th and 21st century. But it reflects what India does and feel towards his holiness. So with that, you know, I would like to end my presentation and thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions or discussion, I'm willing to uh, share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for the you know, lovely talk uh, that you gave, uh, giving a perspective of uh, uh, what's happening around and you know, the challenges that China has posed to Tibet and to India. Yes, sir, we are all, um, at least the generation who are born after 1962 or thereabouts uh, who are not uh, you know witness to what happened in uh, the embarrassment india faced with china in those days um, we all have the um, information now to really find out what happened and then uh, we are also embarrassed the way uh, the nehru administration dealt with Tibet in those days in fact recently i think a week or a couple of weeks back uh, his Holiness uh, an interview with Nitin Gokhale. 
in 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 that uh, hello yeah let's continue yes oh, yeah uh, so um, in that interview i think uh, uh, his holiness had said uh, i think that was the first time I, i'm hearing actually uh, dheeraj you need to see there is some cross talk you need to mute somebody else please speak speaking to dr venk mm yeah yeah so sorry Uh, so I think in that uh, talk he kind of uh, told Nitin Gokhale that he was advised by Nehru to uh, you know find a common ground with China, reconcile to the fact that Tibet has to be part of China. Nehru advised him to be uh, nice to China and then somehow find a solution within China. You know this is very 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 unfortunate. Uh, first of all, uh, Nehru does not have a business to tell what the Tibetans are doing. it is for the tibetans to decide what they want whether they want an autonomy within china or they want an independence from china is tibetans uh, tibetans own business and uh, nehru was bigger communist than the chinese i would say I, i don't think our generation anybody has any respect or love for nehru at all for what he has done um, that is a given sir but the tragedy is like what you said we have successive governments have told the same line they have not changed it at all and so we are where we are Uh, what is the roadmap that uh, your uh, uh, community is now seeing? Uh, Dalai Lama, his, his Holiness, had uh, more or less, I think, reconciled at some point in time that uh, he would find some solution within the Chinese uh, establishment to get some degree of autonomy and freedom for your cultural movements, right? Um, uh, but then he left the choice to the Tibetan community uh, to take a call how to go about it. Uh, violence, of course, is not in your DNA. It's not uh, an option that you want to see. But uh, what exactly of the roadmap? It appears to see uh, for uh, analysts like us that it's a matter of uh, when rather than if China has to collapse. Soviet Union has collapsed, and China has to collapse at some point in time because it, it is a lot of artificial, uh, you know, mechanisms in that. So, what is your roadmap, sir? Do you want a town autonomy? Do you want to deal with China? Or you want ultimate uh, independence from China? What is the roadmap that uh, Tibetan community is actually looking? Um, <clears throat> yes, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, met with Nehru, uh, met with various Indian leaders thereafter, went all over the world seeking support. In fact, in 1959, 61, and 65, uh, you know, the we also tried the United Nations route. So at the UN General Assembly, three resolutions were passed, including right of self-determination to the Tibetan people. So there is a United Nations General Assembly resolution saying Tibetans deserve right of self-determination. But the problem is, the General Assembly is more or less advisory body, and uh, you know they don't uh, uh, they don't have executive authority. It lies with the Security Council. And China, as a veto power holder, it's there, so they don't allow even a debate. You know, far less uh, you know, uh, just, uh, supporting the UN General Assembly resolution. So this is another fact. You saw it travel all over the world, and all the countries in the world say the same, the same thing. China is a reality. One China is a reality, and we cannot do anything, even say. Uh, anything that is, that is against the sovereignty and territorial integrity of China, yes. and then Chinese government also said sovereignty and territorial integrity cannot be compromised. Otherwise, we we can talk, right? So that's what Teng Shopping said. Based on all these things, and based on experience of real politics all over the world, including India, and the colonists said, okay, then let's have a win-win solution. It's called middle path, middle way, and uh, so let China put their condition, territorial integrity and sovereignty cannot be challenged. One China cannot be challenged. What we say is repression of the Tibetan people should be end. The Tibetans are suffering now. Tibetans are in a very dire situation now. They have no freedom whatsoever, right? As I mentioned, so let's elevate the sufferings of the Tibetan people. Let let's make their situation better than now. So. To find the middle way, a middle ground, they said, give Tibetan people genuine autonomy. Then we will accept. So this is where we are at the moment. So this is based on part Buddhist notion, Hindu notion of finding a common ground, a peaceful ground based on ahimsa, and also based on real politic. So this is where we are. 
Um, so that's that has been our policy, and you know, and also this as a little way as a strategy is quite brilliant. Uh, for example, a president of Taiwan cannot come to India because China says Taiwan is advocating independence. Uh, and then the uh, president of Taiwan cannot go to Brussels, cannot go to Washington, D.C., even though America and, you know, Taiwan has three communities. They have signed a lot of documents, right? But the president of Taiwan cannot go even to Washington, D.C. But me, I can travel to Washington, D.C., Brussels, you know, and his holiness obviously has traveled all over the world because we follow nonviolence and middle way. So as a strategy, it gives us the flexibility and the space to travel all over the world and share our thoughts and advocate our cause. Otherwise, if we become even like Taiwan, where we to, to an island and a couple of, you know, dozen or two dozen countries which recognize it, very small island countries, then our movement and our issue will be restricted. That way, middle way and not balance help us to expand this space and travel all over the world to make a Tibet issue known. That's why you know, internationally, Tibet issue has been a number one or two or three for a long time, for, for a long time, primarily because middle way and nonviolence. Yeah, but uh, we don't see any respite uh, from the atrocities that the Chinese regime, the communist regime has been unleashing on Tibet as well as in Xinjiang. Um, I mean, any amount of, uh, they don't value their own uh, soldiers. I mean, people who died in the Galvan Valley, they did not even uh, honor them. So what are they going to honor the rest of the citizens? So at least uh, we in India, we are very clear that there's no hope uh, that they will daily honor any human rights of Tibetans. So the road definitely seems to be challenging for you. Um, That's true. You know, I mean, I appreciate Giridharji that, you know, you all uh, want to support Tibet in a much bigger way. But Indian government is also bound by all the bilateral treaties that they have signed with China. And in all the bilateral treaties, they ac accept and recognize this one China policy. They also recognize this, you know, China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Yeah, right. but uh, uh, Your Excellency, the point is uh, when uh, we have signed those agreements, it has to be reciprocal. When... Yes. Uh, we are accepting a one China policy. China doesn't accept one India policy. So they have not accepted that uh, the entire uh, uh, region of uh, Jammu and Kashmir belongs to India. That includes Aksai Chin, right? And uh, they don't accept Arunachal Pradesh to be part of India. Uh, Sikkim, with a lot of reluctance, they have just accepted it recently. So uh, they, have, they have not accepted uh, one India policy. So I don't think India is, uh, you know, uh, bound to really stick on to their agreements in the long run. India should resent in our view. But I agree with you. Uh, Indian government uh, has not, uh, you know, taken a uh, stand which we all wanted to take. Um, uh, Your Excellency, we have a fundamental difference between the way Indian government reacts and the way Bharat reacts. Bharat recognizes you, sir, as a legitimate government of Tibet. And we give you all the honor and respect, irrespective of what the government of India does. The people of this country have a lot of respect, reverence for His Holiness, and uh, you know your are honored guests. Uh, government of India has not caused any impediments in you, but they did not allow you any political activities in a big scale as well. So um, our sincere wish is government of India changes in some in some point in time. But do you see? I know this is a very politically not a great question to ask. But do you see that uh, at some future point in time, the current uh, legal territory of China is likely to impact the way Soviet Union has collapsed? Do you think China is likely to go down because its economy is going down, it's unable to control uh, Tibet or Xinjiang? Uh, given this kind of a situation where the world is turning against China, do you foresee that the China is likely to uh, you know, go down to only the Han Chinese Central Middle Kingdom. Now, yes, before I answer that, as you mentioned, Aksai Chin, the whole dispute at the moment, right? The road connecting Xinjiang through Aksai Chin to Tibet was built in 1957-58 after the occupation of Tibet, right? Correct. Correct. So anything you mentioned about China and Tibet on land territory is connected with Tibet. Correct. Uh, now, as far as China is concerned, yes, no one can say what will happen. 
because I've been to Baltic states, right? This is a small country, it's in Baltics. And when I, when I went there, even they said, you know, in 1987, 88, 89, you know, even a few months prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, they didn't know. In fact, uh, one activist who is an ardent advocate of independence of the Baltic country uh, uh, told his friend, you know, hey, you've been an you know, activist for so long. What, are you, what do you think will happen? In 1988, the activists who believed in the cause said, in 50 years, maybe something will happen, right? Just next year it happened, and during Berlin Wall also, then foreign uh, minister and the chancellor was visiting the president of Poland, Le Wallace, right? And then uh, this foreign minister asked Le Wallace, "What's happening uh, at, the, in, at, at the wall?" And Le Wallace, then foreign minister, then president of Poland, told them, "Wall is coming down. Be ready." Then foreign minister of West Germany said, "I wish." such trouble will happen, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Within a few months, Berlin Wall came down. So even then, foreign minister of West Germany didn't know what was happening, right? So in this world, we will never know. I mean, if you look at the uh, Northern Ireland conflict, when people of same religion was killing each other, it looked like intractable, but they got this Good Friday Agreement. Nelson Mandela spent, you know, 27 years in prison and eight years in solitary confinement. People gave hope for South Africa, even for Nelson Mandela, who got free, restored democracy. Even India, for 250 years, they thought, you know, British Raj is good and, you know, you can't escape uh, British rule. Uh, but then it happened. So history is full of justice and freedom. So we are always very hopeful. Freedom for Tibetan people will be restored because we believe in Ahimsa and justice will happen to us one day soon. I really hope and pray to Lord Buddha to, you know, give you... Lord Christ Shiva, who is in Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, um, uh, isn't it uh, important also that uh, Tibet and India, Tibetan government and Indian government, uh, at some level, may not be at the official level, whatever, at the intellectual level or whatever it is, we start talking about our own border debates, you know, border issues. In fact, before China occupied, there were issues. I think uh, the Tibetan government had written to Nehru government with regard to some disputes on the borderlands, right? So, is it not important that uh, after China leaves, we still, uh, you know, don't have these uh, baggage carrying on? Uh, we enter into some kind of a discussion and see that. Uh, you know, we have a harmonious borders for both of us. Is it not important that we close all our differences? So I think, yeah, you mentioned it. You know, others have also mentioned the uh, telegram sent by Tibetan government in 1947 to the government of India, you know. Yes, yeah. Yes, telegram was sent. But if you look at the reality of the border, 3,488 kilometers long border had only 75 Tibetan sepoys guarding it. Okay, so we didn't even have one person per kilometer. We had one person every, you know, 50 kilometers. So that means it was trust, right? So, you know, you might write a few things, but the reality was we had open border. All the pilgrims who wanted to go to Mansolova, Mount Kailash, didn't need to apply for visa. In fact, you know, they can go through Demchok route, you know, uh, through Ladakh. That's the shortest, quickest route. Now, Chinese government say you can't use Demchok. Now you have to use, you know, Sikkim and you have to use the most difficult, longer routes. And Tibetan said, no, not even Demchok. It's a come anywhere. You can come in any time. And in fact, they can get in and get out, right? So this was our trust. And that's why I said, spiritually, when you opened our scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, first we say, Om to Holy Land of India, pay respect to all the great masters. Then only we read our scriptures. So that much of respect was inculcated in us, every Tibetan. Right? So it's natural. Our feeling towards India was very natural. Uh, so that will continue. Even nowadays, recently, I think there was uh, a couple of you know, protests against uh, the border incursions uh, in Toronto and New York and different parts of the world. But I'm sure you have seen footages. You can Google and you'll find them. There were more Tibetans than Indians in all those protests. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> so Tibetans, they have moved to Canada. They're citizens of Canada. They're so far away. 
But whenever there's a protest in support of India, there are more Tibetans come than Indians. So there are more Indians in Toronto than Tibetans. Okay, there are more Indians than uh, uh, Tibetans in uh, New York. But the participation is sometimes 75% to 20%, 25%, sometimes 90% to 10%. So this shows our love inherently. You know, of course, Tibetans in India, but everywhere, including in Tibet. Yeah. Uh, but then, um, uh, Your Excellency, um, assuming, I mean, this is again a hypothetical question, assuming, uh, uh, I mean, uh, China breaks up and then Tibet gains its uh, true independence at some point in time. Uh, don't you think you are surrounded by three uh, powerful forces and landlords? Uh, Russia has its history of, uh, you know, even as recently they have even uh, occupied uh, Crimea. So they, they, are, they are no great friends. I mean, they can walk in, they've entered Afghanistan, they can do a lot of funny things. And China, we have known what China has been. So again, going back to China for suzerainty doesn't make sense. India, of course, is never an expansionist, but um, you, don't you think uh, uh, you know uh, it is safer to be somewhere legally connected to India in some loose form, like let's say how Bhutan has done. Probably Bhutan has given up its foreign policy and uh, its military to India to retain its internal affairs. Some kind of an arrangement of that nature, do you think is something useful or you think that uh, Tibet will be able to manage all the three forces all by itself? No, I mean, you know, that's, uh, you know, in the future, and it depends what happens in the future. But uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, Tibet was always more connected with India, geographically, culturally, spiritually, socially, even politically. The similar convention came about, you know, similar convention with India and Pakistan is very well known, but similar convention came about because Tibetans said, okay, we will help you demarcate the border between India and Tibet to India's favor. Help us persuade the Chinese government to demarcate the border between Tibet and China. So Chinese ambassador was present in Simla, but finally he did not sign the convention. Right? So even the similar convention was signed to support India, it was British India. So you mentioned Telegram, right, with 1947. But, you know, similar convention is there. We gave you the land. Indian government and India is not recognizing that. You say, yeah, we want this Magma online, but there's no formal recognition. So we have given you, but you're not recognizing it. Now, raising the issue of Telegram looks little, you know, uh, minor, so to speak, right? First, recognize the similar convention, then say it's indo tibet border, then we will speak. Once yes. you say Indo-Tibet border, then Tibetans have legitimate voice. Yes. Once you say Tibet is occupied, we are saying, then we say it's occupied. China has no business. Even you. I'm on the record. A lot of media asks, what about this Galwan Valley and border? I said, not even a shred of land belongs to China. This border does not belong to China. Now support us. And you also say, yes, this is Tibetan border. This is not Chinese border. Yeah. Then we walk together. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're saying about Galwan Valley. Sorry, uh, Your Excellency. Um, I, I think all, I already said so. Uh, what I'm trying to say is we ceded Magma border, right? We have given you writing. British India has recognized it. Now, Indian government should recognize it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, so, definitely. What I'm trying to say, if you bring telegrams, so something we have bigger than that, we have all recognized, and Indian government is not recognized. So, it's time for India and Indian Janta to say, this is Indo-Tibet border, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Galwan Valley and other, uh, other issues, I've always said, this border, this land does not belong to China. That's our stand. Now support Correct. us and say, yes, you're right. Galwan Valley does not belong to China. The border is not with China. Then you are validating our voice. Then we will speak. Definitely. Definitely. Friends, uh, you can use the hand button uh, where you can raise your hand. And I can call you for... Uh... So a few questions uh, to His Excellency while I ask him a couple of more. Uh, please use the hand button against your name and then you can raise whoever wants to ask His Excellency any question. Uh, 
so uh, we have a connection to uh, tibet as well from our state uh, your excellency because our aka acha nagarjuna comes from our state uh, from andhra pradesh he was uh, one of the departmental heads in nalanda and i think the nalanda school uh, he had not contributed uh, as uh, head of the department in nalanda as well so we do have a connection to tibet this did uh, dal chakra in the state of andhra pradesh in amaravati a few years back as well so um, from our side uh, you know we have long uh, forgotten uh, the buddhist traditions because though it was a land of our origin of buddha here but then uh, over a period of time uh, we have converted into whatever you know we have we have lost that connection with uh, buddhism i think china seems to be seeding it is it seems to be taking the lead in terms of buddhism though they are communists and they don't care for religion they seem to be talking about buddhism so in that context i think he here reports that um, uh, you know after uh, his holiness the dalai lama passes on uh, what about uh, his successor they seem to be wanting to install his successor and uh, i think uh, he and the tibetan community said we will decide but uh, that is an area of uh, uh, you know uh, issue that uh, i am foreseeing so how do you see the chinese move in terms of a religious um, take over of the buddhist uh, uh, you know influence in the world they seem to be saying future buddha and you know laughing buddha what not actually gautam buddha is completely lost out it is all the chinese buddha they are talking about from a religious point of view how do you see the invasion of chinese into all uh, your religious issues yes you know if you go to his holiness residence if you go to any tibetan monastery you will see a thangka painting or portraits of 17 nalanda masters so we call it monastery we call it tibetan temple but actually these are the original design of nalanda university we are recreating it we have reestablished we have you know uh, 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 promoted it so inside all the masters are nalanda masters the nagarjuna is one and shanti deva and others uh, are there so you know even his holiness sits on the floor or on his chair but he looks at nalanda masters as the guru so that's why he always say bharat is my guru i am bharat chela Uh, but given the status of nalanda tradition in india i think chela is little better uh, informed and educated than the guru you know so we took nalanda tradition to tibet in 7th and 8th centuries now i mentioned there are like 52 countries which follows buddhism majority and 150 countries has some section of population who follow buddhism including india right no country has more than a dozen or two dozen of what buddha said if you want to know what original buddha Bu, uh, the buddha's wisdoms are it's in tibetan language we learn sanskrit we learn buddhism we took it that we translated it in tibetan now we have 330 some volumes of what buddha and his disciples have said India doesn't have more than two do- two dozen volumes. China doesn't have two dozen volumes. Korea, you just name any Buddhist country, no one has more than two dozen volumes. We are the only one who has preserved three hundred plus volumes. Now everybody talks about India being a land of Buddha and Buddhism. Hello, we yes, have preserved what Buddha said, yes. not India or anyone else. So His Holiness wants to revive Nalanda tradition. nalanda wisdom back in india this is where it should belong and as i mentioned in my statement the greatest export of india to the world has been buddhism now they are you're charging gst without much investment right so now what's happening china is trying to monopolize buddhism so now they don't have bodh gaya where buddha got enlightened they don't have varanasi sarnath where buddha gave first teaching and so and so forth where buddha died right they don't have holy uh, pilgrim sites like that what they have done is they have built the largest statue of buddha the biggest temple things like that and they call themselves the land of buddhism and oddly china you know is the largest buddhist country in the world do you know that 400 million chinese follow buddhism and they take this credit they claim 
And if you go to any Buddhist sites and pilgrim sites in China, they have like two-way lane and three-lane highways. Highway. But now if you go to Sarnath and Bodh Gaya, you know, all this, uh, the Buddhist sites, yeah, the, the infrastructure is lagging behind. So they invite all the Buddhist leaders from all over the world to China every year. They throw big events. They give them VIP receptions. And Buddhist leaders from all over the world are dying to come to India. You don't need to send limousine, car, things like that. All you need to send is email to Buddhist leaders around the world and say, we have an event in Bodh Gaya. Everybody will rush and come. So India needs to play its Buddhist card because Buddhism is low-hanging fruit for India. It's a natural. But China is over, you know, already playing it. They are like 10, 20 years ahead of India, even on spiritual front. So this is something we need to think because as it is, Tibetans have preserved Buddhist wisdom. And His Holiness wants to revive Nalanda tradition in India, give it back to the masters where it belongs. And the reception has to be big and great so when you know buddhism spread from you know second century all the way to 13th century when nalanda university and takshashila was there india was number one in spirituality in knowledge in economy and civilizationally politically now india talks about becoming number one india was number one for thousand years it corresponds with the nalanda tradition in nalanda university so if you revive Nalanda University, chances of India becoming Nalanda, uh, number one is high because it was already number one when Nalanda University was there. Nalanda wisdom is there. And Tibetans are the source, original preserver of Nalanda tradition. And His Holiness Dalai Lama is the greatest master of Nalanda tradition. So it's the treasure India has. Yes. I got a question, yeah. Yeah, can you yeah. just brief? And one more thing about Nalanda. I have a friend, in fact, who has been working on that, you know, revival of Nalanda circuit since last 20 years. His name is Deepak Anand. So, uh, BJYM has been uh, focusing on Indo-Tibetan relations. Uh, I would just like to know if uh, you have a program from the Tibetan side on how to utilize BJYM. Uh, sorry, Bharat, Bharat Tibet Sayog Manch. Sorry, sorry. BT, uh, yeah, Bharat Tibet Sayog Manch. Dhanavad. Uh, Bharat Tibet Sayog Manch has been a great supporter of Tibet. And uh, through his branches, you know, they are reaching out to schools also, creating awareness why Tibet is, you know, important spiritually and for security of India. So I think Bharat Tibet Sayog Manch is doing a good job. And uh, I want to applaud all the members and uh, urge them to continue to support us. 
Now, yes, you're right. 19, for, from uh, 1947 to 2013 and from 2013 till now, uh, you're right. But whenever any prime minister, I don't want to name names, prime minister comes to Delhi, uh, you know, they have to choose either competition with China or cooperation with China. So some start with competition, ultimately land up in cooperation. By and large, all the prime ministers of India have leaned towards cooperation with China, not competition. So uh, even Modi Sarkar uh, initially chose competition in between a bit of cooperation. Now realization perhaps is leaning towards you know, uh, competition. Uh, so this is what we have seen, not just in India. America was number one token of competition. But in 1970s, they chose cooperation. Uh, President Nixon and you know his uh, uh, national security advisor Kissinger said cooperation and that thought or that ideology continued uh, till recently. Now in Washington, D.C., there's consensus. China is a competition, is adversary number one, right? So you go to Europe, same thing. They initially was, then they went through this cooperation. And now in recent years, they are, they are leaning towards uh, competition. So this is the choice uh, uh, in front of India as well. Uh, ultimately, whether you like it or not, China will compete. Will press with me. All neighbors, they are all ready. Please. So rich. And they, they keep coming. So the choice before India is competition or cooperation. And here, George Fernandez, when he was defense minister, said, you know, uh, uh, China is potential number one. So what he said is becoming true. <coughs> Gridharji, you are muted. Yeah, I, I, I was just uh, telling my host uh, to mute some of the calls uh, where we are getting disturbance. Somebody by name Navneet, kindly mute, please. Unfortunately, they are doing it for the first time. Yeah, yeah. See, while others are talking, kindly all of you mute, please, so that we don't have much talks. Yeah. Um, so, um, just one point. His Excellency, yeah? I would just like to bring on your phone. There is a and we look at every 10 years as a sense of development. No, no. Yeah. Basishji, we, we can't hear you properly. I think I think we leave it there. Basishji, I think we leave it there. Uh, I think uh, we leave it there. I think uh, His Excellency has answered it. So there is something uh, we shouldn't uh, push beyond a point. Um, that is the fact that the Indian governments uh, did not act the way the rest of the Bharat also wants it. And so, uh, legitimately, the Tibetan uh, people uh, are having hopes on the government, but it is not uh, really inevitable. It's not to name ex prime minister or y prime minister, but the policy is the deep Indian state establishment which runs this particular uh, policy. And so, irrespective of the prime minister who is in command, this has not changed in India, which is a sad part. We, as intellectuals, as Bharatiyas, we will have to insist and put pressure on the government to start changing this policy. Start uh, accepting the fact uh, that India and Tibet had a border, India and China didn't have a border. Uh, you know, uh, we have gone and signed uh, agreements with them, recognizing their suzerainty over Tibet. That needs to change. When we could go and cross the international border and strike in uh, Palakot, uh, you know, uh, breaking all the previous conventions, we should also break this convention. Uh, I think His Excellency has said what best he can say, and I don't think we should push him beyond that. Um, I think we are running out of time. Uh, maybe one or two questions at best that we can take. Um, can I? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar from Pudari. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, His Excellency, thank you very much for that uh, good talk. Uh, I was in Tibet in 1918, so everything, I was always thinking, why is Tibet? in China, you know, that's the first thought any Indian should get. So just to uh, uh, follow on what you said, the education that you are giving, because what I heard from you, just reinforced in a stronger way, 
what little bit I knew. And uh, there is a lot of uh, Tibetan community, for example, in Karnataka, where I live, at least two co- uh, I mean, um, settlements. We should use them to educate the people now about what's happening, like similar to what you said, because that gives a better perspective rather than reading in a book. And this is the best time because of the what's happening in the border. So people will be more aware and uh, just knowing the history of Tibet will tell them why China is a problem to India. And uh, I wish Tibet is independent soon and hopefully by God's grace, he will be the first president in a long while. Thank you. And Pragya Bharati can play that role because we have branches all over. So facilitate that. Yes, this is Nagesh. I have one question, simple question. For excellency, your Tawan, Tawan, who the Indian government in exile recognizes that as an Indian territory? Uh, yes, and uh, the fact that you are asking this question, you know, uh, amazes me because in 1914, we signed the document British India saying Taiwan is part of India. Sure. And the Melbourne line border was drawn. Right. So as I said, you know, India still follows all kinds of arcane rules and regulations introduced by British 100 years, 200 years ago. But one good thing British Raj has done is give Taiwan to India based on, you know, a similar convention based on Melbourne line. The Indian Prime Minister already signed it in 1914. Now, India wants Tawang, India wants Mohan, but the government and people don't recognize it, you see. So we have already done it on paper. We are obligated by the agreement. But the Indian government is not saying whether they are obligated or not. So it's not a problem. We have gave you in writing. Yeah. They give us back in writing saying, yeah, recognize Mohan line. Thank you very much. We are waiting for that. <laughs> Since 1914, it's been 100 years. Yeah. In fact, uh, China recognizes the Macmahon line uh, border with Burma, but uh, it says uh, Macmahon line with India, uh, they don't accept it. It's very funny and Indians, uh, I think, should uh, just stick to it and say uh, Macmahon line signed with India is the border and that's it. You know, Gurudarji, recently, you know, the uh, Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh tweeted during this Galwan tragedy. Mm-hmm. He went to meet Indian Jawans and, you know, uh, who are guarding the border of India and Tibet, the hero of Indo-Tibet border. Correct. Media people, everybody is saying, what is the chief minister doing? Is he provocative? He is angering China or not? Why is he doing that? I say, he's saying the right thing. Correct. His Correct. family is from that area. They always say Tibet border, Indo-Tibet border. They never say Indo-China border. For him to say Indo-China border is, is an exception, you know. But now the convention wisdom has been the mainstream is Indochina border. Now, when Chief Minister says something right for the sake of India, he is shown as this periphery, you know, uh, the person, he's a rebel and he's making maverick and he's creating trouble. No, he should be applauded. Correct. Um, so even I had visited the Indo Tibetan border uh, near Tawang um, about four or five years back. So the the army officers there uh, do a guided tour of people. They explain, they say, you know, they, as you know, there's no border there. Uh, there's no fencing there. They say, you know, from uh, this stone, uh, this is China, and this is India, he said. And so I corrected him. I said, never ever say that. Because you are, hundreds of Indians are visiting this place. And so you are the guide to them. Uh, there's nobody coming from the Tibet side. I told him, you always tell him, China occupied Tibet. Use these words. Please rectify yourself and say China occupied Tibet. So this is Tibet and this is India and occupied by China. Be very clear in your statement. I quoted. So no, uh, yeah, yeah, Giridharji, you know, it's you know, it's amazing. On the one hand, you know, the Indian Jawan, everybody says Indo-China border. Then suddenly they ask the price. Why are uh, Chinese soldiers coming to the border? <laughs> you call it Chinese border. They will come to Chinese territory, right? Yeah, so sure. you bring them. So. You know, so that, you know, is something one should bear in mind. But just by saying it, you're inviting them and justifying their presence. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Lopsangji, uh, Your Excellency. I would now request uh, our uh, state president, uh, 
Rajabhaskar Reddy Ji to propose a word of thanks. Um, one and a half hours we have taken your time and uh, you know it's not fair that we keep you uh, for long. I know you are a very busy man. Uh, you have a lot of uh, commitments and especially uh, this part of the time uh, you have been inundated with a lot of requests. I, we understand that. I request all of you to bear with us. We will not be able to accommodate more questions uh, uh, given the time constraint. Uh, uh, Mr. Lopsang has to leave. So, no, uh, uh, yeah, okay, give the let me, uh, yeah, yes, one thing. Now, someone asked me about one, right? Yeah, Said yeah. that when the Magmon line was drawn, there were three options, including Tawang to Tawang, and one including Sona area, right? And we chose the line which included Tawang as part of India. Yeah. We had three options. Time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That means your institute will send us a thank you note on Magma Online, okay? After hundred some years, <laughs> we, we are thankful to you on that, and I don't think there's there should not be a dispute uh, with uh, whatever Shimla agreement we had done in 1914 with uh, Tibet, and that should be the guiding principle. And uh, whether China accepts it or not, uh, Indian government, Indian people should accept this. And like what you said, we need to have a porous border. Uh, we need to have cultural interaction, uh, like we have with Bhutan, we have with uh, Nepal already. I think we should have it in Tibet as well. And um, uh, you know, uh, our Indian culture uh, is a lot has been forgotten there. The origins of Brahmaputra, the origins of Sindhu River are all uh, oh, yes. in the Tibetan area. And uh, 2021 is actually extremely important for Telugu people because uh, we have a concept called Pushkaram. It comes every 12 years. Uh, each year for one river. So 2021 is for Sindhu River. Ideally speaking, if China was not involved, uh, you know, people from Andhra Pradesh and Telangana would love to come to the origin of uh, Indus River. Oh. So we go to Gango 3 when uh, Ganga Pushkaram happens. We go to Yamuno 3 when Yamuna Pushkaram happens. We go to Mahabaleshwar when Krishna Pushkaram happens. You know, like that. The origin of a river is very holy for us. So next year, 2021, uh, if... Uh, uh, Chinese restrictions are not there. Uh, it would be ideal for us to go there. Hopefully, in the next push current, 20 years from then, uh, if we have uh, more breathing space in Tibet, um, we will definitely take a contingent of uh, Telugu people to the holy site. Yes, Giridharji, you raise another big issue why Tibet is environmentally so important, right? Yeah. Now, you mentioned Indus River, you yeah. know. Yeah. The, the water of Indus River is a direct glacier meant of Tibet. So there's uh, Indus River, Brahmaputra River, Salven, Mekong, all the rivers flow from Tibet. Yeah. So in South Asia, population is 22% of the world population, but only 8.3% of fresh water. Okay. So already, nearly 14% of South Asia are facing scarcity of fresh water. And Tibet is the source of fresh water. China sits on the Tibet, Tibet plateau. They control the flow of rivers, right? And they are trying to divert rivers, including Brahmaputra, which will be devastating, which will be devastating for the uh, people downstream. Right, and, and the Indus River, as you said, next year is very important. So it's very important for people in, you know, uh, the Telugu people to know. Indus River, especially the 40% of water of Indus River is a Tibetan glacier. Melt of uh, 40% of river. Normally you add a lot of rainwater, right? The one river which has the largest volume of Tibetan snow and glacier is Indus River. So, so the term India comes from Indus River. Yes? Yeah, true. So 40% of the Indus River, Tibetan snow and Tibetan glacier. So we have 40% claim over term Indus River, which means we have 40% claim over the term India. Correct. So we are Buddhists. We don't charge copyright and you know patent <laughs> over India. Otherwise, we are forty percent claim. <laughs> so we've been sharing we, with India. Neither are we charging patent for Buddhism on you. Anyway. <laughs> what we have done more for you, you from Buddhist point of view, we have preserved the teachings of Buddha, not India. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rajabaskar Ji. Please uh, propose a word of thanks. Uh, Dr. Rajabaskar Ji is our president of. Uh, uh, Pragya Bharati Telangana State Unit. So uh, he's a practicing dental surgeon in the city of Karim Nagar. So he shall propose a word of thanks and uh, we will not take much of your time. Yeah, Rajabhaskar Ditch. Namaskar. Your Excellency Dr. Lapsang Gange, 
President of uh, Tibetan Government in Exile. We are honored by your presence and impressed by your address in our Pragna Bharati virtual show. We support your struggle for uh, rights of people and the freedom of Tibet. And Bharat as a nation is for the justice for Tibetan people. Justice for Tibet means peace in the region and also it will save democracy and individual freedom. Now, it is a privilege to propose a lot of thanks and also thank you very much for sparing this where your valuable time on our platform and uh, we have our understanding about the Tibetan issue <clears throat> and what unfortunate happened with Tibet has really improved and uh, this can create a lot of awareness amongst the people in Bharat and also provide create a lot of support for the Tibetan struggle and uh, I also thank one and all for joining in this program. Thank you very much. Thank Namaste. you. Thank you so much. Namaste and Bharat Mataki. Bharat Mataki Jai.